So uh, welcome everybody, to those of you who are here and to our online audience. Today, today we are welcoming Dimitra from Paris. Dimitra uh, did her BA uh, in Athens and then moved to uh, Paris where she did her MA in languages and literature of classical antiquity. Um, she then continued in Paris and she did her PhD uh, working on a thesis on edition, translation and commentary of Antigonus' collection of extraordinary stories. Um, today, she's here with us presenting the circulation of knowledge in antiquity comparing to paradoxographical texts. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. And Hello, I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, the, the, this uh, session to make subject uh, is a little bit tricky and complicated. I will not uh, speak in detail, but uh, I will try to uh, give you uh, the outlines of uh, what we call in classics uh, paradoxography. So, uh, our main subject is the examination of paradoxical passages between two representative texts of the so called gender of paradoxography. Uh, On the one hand, we have a collection of extraordinary stories attributed to uh, Antigonus of Carystos, uh, which uh, I will want so far to Antigonus. And on the other hand, we have uh, the uh, secular Aristotelian on Marvel Stins uh, or Mirabilia. We will examine the differences, the similarities, uh, as well as the way that knowledge circulated in antiquity and influenced the writing and the development of uh, a work. But uh, let me first uh, introduce you briefly to what truly paradoxography is or seems to be, as I assume that not all of you uh, are relevant to the subject, which is quite normal. So for me, as I be the student uh, in Paris, I was trying hardly to translate and uh, decipher Antigone's text. So I soon became aware that paradoxography is not a type of literature uh, destined to a less educated or a less acquainted uh, public. It is not thus destined just to divert or to please as we uh, thought it should be. First of all, uh, we shall note that the term paradoxography uh, does not exist uh, per se in antiquity. On the contrary, uh, it is a post classical Byzantine neologism found for the first time in uh, the Heliades of uh, John Zetis, the, uh, the verse is uh, book. 2.35.131. The rediscovery of this term is a modern construction of the 19th century, and this is due to editorial reasons. More precisely, Anton Westermann used this term for the edition of his uh, collection named Paradoxographic Reiki in uh, uh, 1839. So, what we call uh, paradoxography has started long uh, before the Hellenistic era. We all know, for example, the Thomas Tyre of Herodotus, or even the digressions uh, of um, Xenophon and Thucydides. Uh, stories from Egypt and strange places far across uh, the universe, far from Greece. First attested in the 3rd century BC, paradoxography was associated mainly uh, with these ethnographic works. So, in a manner of speaking, paradoxography uh, existed already, only it did so in a, in a very different form. These authors, uh, like Herodotus or Thucydides or Xenophon, uh, were basically based on oral traditions and oral accounts which they tried to write down. On the contrary, during the Hellenistic age in which lived uh, Antigonus, Callimachus, uh, the writer of uh, Mirabilia, and many others, 
uh, during so many decades, this uh, past knowledge has already been written down, classified, and conserved in uh, the vast library of Alexandria. Kalimachus um, is considered to be the father of uh, paleogeography. And apart from his uh, well-known pinages, apart from uh, uh, this catalog of books uh, in the lab of Alexandria, he also wrote a work named a uh, collection of wonders from all earth arranged, arranged by the cases. Uh, on this work, Antigonus is mainly based uh, for his own uh, work collection of extraordinary stories. Adding at the same time uh, a lot of uh, new fragments coming from less known authors. So, uh, Hellenistic authors were no more based on oral tradition but on the literature itself, as they could uh, draw any information directly from the text and from the books. Uh, for a detailed examination of paradoxical texts, uh, we can find out among the authors shared as characterized as paradoxographers, uh, common editorial practices and techniques uh, such as organization, the optimization, the reorganization, and the rewriting of passages. Uh, paraphrases also and the resumes. I personally, in my PhD dissertation, was able to qualify and determine paradoxography not just as uh, the oddities of nature, but uh, as something more uh, high, higher than this and more complicated. For me, so for modern researchers as well, uh, a paradoxon is an event uh, not opposed to nature, but a part of nature as well. It is constructed and uh, manipulated by authors in such a way so that admiration is highly provoked. The construction thus of a paradoxon follows a determined route. A fact um, is extracted from its original context and is integrated into a new literary context when, uh, where it takes uh, a new meaning. As a result, uh, this uh, excavated passage is flexible and open to new interpretations. The first scholar who was occupied with this um, is a French scholar, Christian Jacob, who, in 1920, uh, sorry, 1980, published an article entitled uh, La Fabrication de l'Opéier, in which um, he proved how. A paradoxical fact, uh, separated from its original literary context, can gain, can obtain uh, a new interpretation into a new, uh, into a new context. <coughs> so, in a manner of speaking, the paradoxon is based on a polarity. This is a polarity of what is accepted and what is not accepted as natural, of uh, what is common and of what is rare of the probable and the improbable. Uh, and it serves as a challenge to our received ideas of uh, what is plausible and what is not. Paradoxography is thus uh, a practice of writing down these facts. Um, so I understand that this is a huge discussion to be uh, developed here in the depth, but um, for the time being, we should keep just in mind that paradoxographical texts are, are not written for uh, an uneducated public, uh, but um, they were written for an educated public, and so that paradoxography is not thus considered as a secondary type of uh, literature compared to the classical one. So we will now proceed to the main subject of uh, this speech, uh, which is the presentation and the comparison of two paradoxographical texts. Um, so Pantipolis' text is transmitted to us by a unique uh, Byzantine codex 
which is the Palatinus Heidegger Genesis 398, conserved in the University Library of Heidelberg since uh, the mid uh, 19th century. Uh, however, modern research is not uh, absolutely sure about the origins and the identity of the pseudo-Aristotelian memorabilia. Uh, I present you a screenshot of the database of the Research Institute of History of Text in Paris, in uh, which uh, there are two of them. So, uh, in this screenshot, we can see that uh, a manuscript of uh, this memorabilia and numerous editions. Uh, since the first edition in 1495, are available. According now to Pierre Moreau, another French scholar, who uh, characterizes uh, the Mirabilia as an apocryphal <coughs> uh, work, uh, the Mirabilia are not recorded in the large list of uh, Aristotelian works written by uh, the agents Aristotle, but exist another list, such as the list of uh, works uh, written by Ptolemy Algori and the list of uh, anonymous of many ages. These two lists do not have the same origin. According again to Pierre Moreau, the list of, of uh, Ptolemy is close to a list written by Andronicus, while the one of anonymous of many ages is approaching the repertoire of the series of Melissa. Despite the fact uh, that uh, the collection of extraordinary stories of antiquities lacks, uh, according to some scholars, a clear beginning, it seems to have been written uh, in uh, a specific era. This is about the middle of uh, the second century BC. On the other hand, uh, the Septuagintarian Mirabilia seem not to have been written in a singular, in a singular effort. And more precisely, the central part of, uh, of the work describing the marvels of uh, animals and plants circulated in the end of the during the Hellenic decades, and it was based on classical, uh, obscure, original source. Uh, Coming apparently from the Aristotelian tradition in general. The second half was composed probably between the third and the fifth century AD. So we cannot determine with certainty the origin or the exact date of, um, of the Mirabilia, but a lot of resemblances to the Antigonus collection of extraordinary stories cannot go unnoticed. Uh, what do these two treatises have in common? First of all, they are both fairly uh, They have approximately the same number of passages. They are around uh, 180 passages. Secondly, the thematic uh, circles are the same. Marvelous observations coming from the animal kingdom, from nature, from plants, from stones, uh, etc. Thirdly, both, both authors uh, work, uh, work in the same uh, way. They extract, they rewrite, they paraphrase, they paraphrase, they resume passages that exist already uh, in the Aristotelian tradition and not only there. The problem of the while reading these passages is a possible contamination of sources especially as far as the unidentified passages of either Aristotle or his pupil Theophrastus are concerned. This problem is uh, intensified by the loss of uh, the Aristotelian sources, especially after the death of Theophrastus. Um, Irene Pajonera, a um, contemporary researcher, and a very good colleague, in a recent article, um, based on some passages of uh, Posidonius of Rhodes, uh, she was able to elucidate some uh, aspect of this uh, problem, the loss of the Aristotelian uh, texts. Uh, she was able to prove that uh, a minor corpus of the Aristotelian natural philology actually did survive, circulated, and uh, transmitted through 
the peripatetic tradition of, uh, of road. It is actually a great help to us uh, so that we can understand uh, how some passages that lack, uh, uh, that lack uh, a certain origin have come down to the head in the gear. So we shall start uh, our comparisons now. Um, so as we start, some preliminary technical notes uh, for you to know. So I have divided this um, passage in four categories in order to facilitate the process. Uh, the first one is passages coming from uh, Aristotle's history of animals, the divergences and the convergences. Uh, the second one is passages coming from the Opomus, the third one from the Limacus, and finally some obscure passages come from the Epistemian tradition in general and many, many other uh, the English translation that we have in hand out uh, is the one given by the U.S. Fed in the one and found also online on the site by the geography that is called. Um, I have intervened in some parts in order to clarify some things for you. A couple uh, of passages are translated by me because I couldn't find uh, any better English translation. Uh, so it's useful also to declare that um, through this comparison we are trying to track back uh, the origins of uh, these passages and um, try to understand how uh, the original sources circulated in antiquity. Um, <coughs> later authors uh, of uh, imperial times and Roman times have the same passages in their own works, like Ovid or like Virgil or whatever. Uh, but now this is not our concern. Our concern is just to uh, track, track back uh, from the Hellenistic era and uh, before. So as I'll mention uh, later writers to you uh, in some passages that uh, clarify uh, some parts or help us understand better the, the original sources. Um, so bear in mind that uh, similar passages with the one presented here can be found in numerous uh, other Greek and Latin authors, but for the time being we shall stay focused on the ones that give us the information we need. Uh, one first uh, type of comparison among the texts of uh, Pseudo-Aristotle Pseudo -Aristotle and uh, Aristotle has already been made by a great uh, scholar and commentator of Aristotle, uh, Valentin Rose, in 1863, in a work of uh, great value for us, although he considered these uh, excerpts, these passages, uh, spurious. So we shall start our examinations from the passages uh, of um, Antigonus and Pseudo Aristotle, which bear a close uh, relationship to uh, the Aristotelian uh, history of animals. Uh, although the relations, uh, the relationship between the history of animals and the text of Pseudo Antigonus is uh, evident and clear, there is no direct connection between Aristotle and Pseudo Aristotle. So, as far as uh, these texts are concerned, we can rely only on speculation uh, and on indirect sources in order to find out a possible uh, intermediary source. Another problem that occurs is uh, the contamination of sources between Aristotle and Theophrastus. The question of a common intermediary source that, that uh, transmits the words of the writer is still open for discussion. We should keep also in mind that the first 15 paragraphs of uh, Pseudo Aristotle do not come uh, from Aristotle himself, but from the Theophrastus' uh, work uh, entitled On the Prudence and uh, Ethos of the Animals. Um, we shall, however, proceed to our examination based on the existing text. I will uh, distinguish uh, the problematic of the relationship among the three authors, Aristotle, Pseudo Aristotle, and Antigonus, in two parts. 
Uh, in the first part, we will examine the divergences of uh, the two parts of the geographical text compared to Aristotle. And in the second part, we will examine the similarities of the two parts of the geographical text with uh, Aristotle. So, we we'll start with our first passage. Um, we will not read them, uh, we will pass them just very quickly, uh, just for you to keep up with uh, what I'm saying. So, this is a passage on the modes, uh, and it's one of the waves in nature. Uh, so, as we see, Cervantigonus. Uh, so, the first column is uh, the text of Cervantigonus, the second one is the Mirabilia of Pseudo Aristotle, and the third one is the original source of the history of animals. Of, uh, of Aristotle. Uh, so, in this uh, case, we can see that the Pseudantigonus and Pseudo Aristotle agree on the fact that there are no moles in the land of uh, Coronia, but the Aristotelian transmission, as you can see, uh, uh, says uh, about uh, another region which is called Levadiaki instead. So, this means that. The two paradoxographers may have had another intermediary source uh, or an indirect source that uh, transmitted Coronia instead of uh, what Aristotle said. Uh, it is true in general that uh, Sector Aristotle follows almost always the Aristotelian text. So, uh, this difference here uh, makes us uh, think of the existence of another source. The second uh, passage um, deals with three animals in the row. This is the gecko, the seal, and the deer. This uh, passage is common in the geographical text. However, it is absent from the Aristotle's history of animals. So why do the paradoxographers refer as a source to Aristotle when this text does not exist in the history of animals nor in any other authentic Aristotelian work? Um, this is a problem here which occurs about what I told you before about the contamination of sources due to the loss of a large part of the Aristotelian uh, tradition. Um, we are able to track their true textual origin, which is an excerpt from Theophrastus, as you can see at the bottom of the PowerPoint, transmitted to us through the Byzantine uh, text of the library of uh, photos. Uh, so Theophrastus is the one who uh, speaks about these three animals and uh, explain uh, the wild phenomenon described above. So, he says that uh, the gecko uh, swallows its skin, the seal vomits its prey, and the deer uh, hides uh, her right cord. So, I open a parenthesis here just to say to you that um, as far as the deer is concerned, semantically there is a problem about uh, if a male deer have a corn, but uh, this is a uh, mythological reference and we will not discuss it here. So, anyways, uh, so according to Theophrastus, uh, the reason why uh, animals present such a uh, weird behavior is uh, jealousy. In fact, uh, these animals are capable of knowing the properties of some very subtle parts of their bodies and try to uh, protect them uh, in this way. Uh, so here we can see clearly that um, what is uh, transmitted under the name of Aristotle may uh, very well be transmitted under the name of the Theophrastus to the name of the Another similar case is uh, the case of the Alp. Uh, another passage attributed by Pseudantigonus to Aristotle again, although it's not found in the history of animals or in any other study of work. Apart from uh, the Mirabilia, which we don't know if it's uh, in any first day of work. Uh, we do find, however, a passage again in Theophrastus, 
uh, which is uh, its uh, actual shores. Uh, as uh, in this passage, the Orphistus mentions after the elk, uh, also uh, the chameleon, the octopus, two other animals with change their colors, and then are treated uh, also in uh, other pages into Sematino and Social World. So, this fact the demonstrates that for these three animals, both Sematinos uh, and Aristotle must have consulted Theophrastus uh, work entitled uh, Only Animals That Change Their Color, according to Valentin uh, Roach. Uh, the final passage here concerns uh, the deer. Uh, so, this is a long narration on uh, the ethos of the deer, which reveals uh, a complementarity between, uh, between the three authors. As you can see from this parallel presentation, Pseudo uh, Aristotle adds uh, some points that Pseudo uh, has uh, omitted in comparison to uh, the Aristotelian text. This means uh, that Pseudo uh, Aristotle is obviously aware of Pseudo Antigone's text and he's careful uh, not to be repetitive in his own text. We continue with uh, similarities. Um, yeah, the convergences. So, the second chapter of the Aristotelian manipulation uh, concerns the similarities found in the Mirabilia and in the collection uh, of Antigonus compared to the history of animals. Or otherwise, the writing of the history of animals by the two paradoxologists. First case is uh, the human and the host. So, in uh, the three passages, uh, the information provided are similar, except that the version of Pseudo Aristotle uh, mentions the location Amphipolis instead of uh, Kedripolis, referred by Pseudo Antigonus and Aristotle himself. Second passage concerns the wild written goats. Uh, here we have the uh, simple passage. All three narrations are similar, no significant changes, everybody is fine, everything is fine, and so on. Uh, the leo part. This is a passage that uh, has a particular problem. Uh, because in this long uh, passage devoted to uh, the leo part and the behavior of this animal, um, Aristotle characterizes, uh, qualifies the animal both as a hunter and as a prey. Pseudo Aristotle, knowing uh, obviously the direct text of uh, Aristotle and Pseudo Antigonus, chooses to mention only the second option. This is uh, the way people apply in order to capture uh, the leopard. As a result, uh, the Aristotelian tradition is split in two by the two paradoxographers, uh, proving that there is a complementary division. Next passage is um, a passage on the cuckoo. The same um, as we uh, saw in the case of the leopard, goes with the case of the cuckoo. Aristotle refers to this word in two occasions. In the history of animals, uh, in book 9 and in books, uh, book 6. Sepultimus, uh, first step, reorganizes this stuff based on his own thematic. And um, Aristotle later, again, in order to avoid uh, repetition, mentions only uh, one of uh, the things mentioned by Pseudantigonus and uh, Aristotle about the food. Uh, this is the construction of the nest and the beauty of the newborn babies. We continue to three, the three next passages, uh, which are quite um, easy and quick. So we have uh, first the wall the sun fiber, a small animal who uh, uh, clean, uh, cleans crocodile's teeth 
uh, we have next the tortoise, uh, the turtle that <coughs> eats uh, oregano after having it uh, with the snake. And uh, the other we have the way pelicans uh, are fed. So in these three cases, uh, the two paramotographers refer uh, correctly their as their source, Aristotle, and rewrite the passages with no significant changes as far as the community is concerned. The next passage um, deals with another split of the Aristotelian tradition. Uh, it's the common and the mayor. So the story, um, the camp, uh, Aristotle uh, originally talks about uh, the behavior of the camel and the mayor, which are similar. And the paradoxographers split this passage into each one uh, choosing to refer at one animal and not uh, in both of them. So, uh, Antigonus uh, mentions uh, the mayor, while St. Aristotle, who is posterior and apparently knows what St. Antigonus has written down, chooses to mention the other one. Uh, the next passage concerns the genitals of uh, a martyr. Similar passages for the three of them, and most of the ones. Uh, so, continue. Continue with the uh, bison. Uh, the original source of this passage is still uncertain. And so, uh, there are no important differences regarding the content. We find the names and variations concerning the location. Uh, as the name of the mountain that buys me is, uh, proposed by St. Antigonus and uh, St. Aristotle, uh, is, um, um, is found only in the lexicographers. And nowhere, nowhere else. Uh, so this makes us uh, think of an error probably in the transmission of uh, the text. Uh, we'll continue with the solid um, hoof of the swans. So the three parts of this here do not present great differences, but again the name of the location of this uh, animal differs. Aristotle and the pseudontinus say that this animal lives in the country of Illyria and in Peonia, while St. Aristotle revives the passage, referring to uh, the location as Macedonia and in Mafia. The name of Mafia, according to Strobo, in his Christomathes uh, 7 fragments 9 to 11, along with Peonia and Macedonia, design, uh, design the same location. So it is probably that uh, Pseudo Aristotle refers to the same location as Aristotle and Antigonus, but he using an updated version uh, of this region used in his time. Uh, this fact can also be uh, used as a sign for uh, dating uh, the Mirabilia in the world. So, these are the passages about Aristotle and the two And the brief conclusion is that the Pseudo Aristotle knows for sure uh, the text of both Pseudo-Antigonus and Aristotle, of course, and tries not to be repetitive. Uh, moreover, it's interesting to notice that Theophrastus is uh, noticed twice, be reassured, uh, instead of uh, Aristotle's. Uh, for, for, for Aristotle, although Sebastian uh, mentioned Aristotle's name. This fact leads our uh, researchers to talk about the combination of names and works uh, during the transmission of the Aristotelian tradition. Maybe some of the writings of Theophrastus circulated uh, in the Hellenistic era under the name of Aristotle. This confusion may have occurred uh, during the transportation of the uh, Library of Alexandria uh, under, um, under of the Australian Library under uh, Nearchus from Alexandria to other places such as uh, Constantinople. 
Uh, it is as evident that parts of the Aristotelian naturalistic works circulate <coughs> uh, independently and in different forms across the Hellenistic kingdoms, and so authors use them uh, in any way they like. So after I start, we'll continue with the passages from Theodorus. A large part of the Pseudo-Aristotelian memorabilia comes from the work of Theodorus. Although Pseudo-Aristotel does not mention Theodorus as his main source, it is clear that paragraphs uh, 115 to 126 come from his work, as we can assume from the comparison with Pseudo-Antiphilus. Uh, uh, the latter uh, mentions explicitly the opus as his source, and so we can compare to the result. So if we combine the data given by both authors, we have some interesting um, <coughs> outcomes. The main work of the opus from uh, which uh, uh, the excerpts uh, are coming uh, is the Thaumasia which we do not know for sure if uh, it is a separate work or if it is a part of the Philippica Theopompus and uh, more particularly the eighth book of Philippica. Anyway, the passages from Theopompus uh, are arranged in the bibliographical order in Aristotle, while the same passages uh, are rearranged um, thematically in Pseudo-Antigonus. We will also observe that Pseudo-Aristotle offers us uh, a larger and more complete version of the facts, which comes probably from other sources that you have the chance to uh, consult, while the version of Pseudo-Antigonus sticks to the open text. Uh, the text of Pseudo-Aristotle uh, can help us reconstitute some passages and specifically the last notice of Pseudo-Antigonus, which is translated to us uh, mutilated, in a certain way, the, uh, uh, the end of the text of Pseudo-Antigonus is not uh, transmitted. So, the first two, uh, two examples are paragraph 14 of Antigonus, and the next one, uh, 36. Uh, come from a thematic category that I have identified in my dissertation as the absence of, uh, of animals according to places. Uh, so it's a, it is a, a catatopus uh, discrimination uh, relative to the one that we find uh, in Calyrus. Uh, in the first um, passage, in the first passage, uh, Theopompus presents us an eponymic etion for the death of the Beatles. This is uh, the eponymic etion is um, is that the name of uh, of, uh, of the location uh, is associated with uh, an animal. So, Cantharola cross for Greeks, Greek means the death of the Beatles. So we observe that the version written down by Pseudo Aristotle integrates also some new elements. Uh, the second <coughs> example uh, from, uh, from Theopompus deals, uh, deals with the strange behavior of a pair of agents in the city of Quran in Thessaly who fly away from the city once they give birth uh, and give uh, in this way another pair of their place. So it's a long waste time explaining this part from the geological or ecological point of view. Uh, we will only state that there are no significant uh, differences between uh, the two versions. Uh, the next four examples, uh, as you can see in your handout, uh, 136, 137, 141, and 42, come also from the Theopompus, uh, probably to the testimony of Calibach. The tradition of the transmission of passages, along with some others as well, is a bit complicated. Uh, the text of Theopompus was saved and transmitted its summary in Kalimachus Masia, and it was again cut and thematically rearranged by Sidon So, briefly, 
Uh, paragraph 136 deals with the extraordinary qualities of the kind of stone that burns better uh, once in touch with water. Uh, paragraph 137 talks about the existence of a kind of rats similar to uh, the rats that exist in Egypt. Um, paragraph 141 deals with the mortal effect of uh, a spring water in Greece. And finally, paragraph uh, 142, uh, with the miraculous effect of another spring whose water can cure any type of disease. Uh, the version of Observatory Stone, as compared to Antigonus, is not uh, substantially uh, different. The last passage for this um, category is uh, also uh, the last passage of Observatory uh, Antigonus, paragraph uh, 172, which comes also from the opposite. This is um, an example of collaboration between animals and humans. The end of the story, as I have already told, uh, is unfortunately not saved. Uh, we can find it, however, in the version of Observer uh, Aristotle, and of course, um, in a later author, Elia, uh, in his work on the nature of animals, book 17, section 6. So, as far as the use and reuse of the opponent's work by the two parties of the is concerned, we can say the following. First of all, Psychonticonus uh, uh, arranged the passages thematically, while Psycho Aristotle uh, arranged his staff bibliography. No significant differences are found between uh, the two of them in terms of uh, vocabulary expressions. Uh, finally, in some cases, uh, the version of the Aristotle is clearer and larger due to the fact that being posterior to the Pontiganus, you have the most sources and more texts on hand to consult. Uh, this uh, observation helps us to reconstitute some passages, like this one, the last one, and add some more information uh, or explications to other passages. So the next uh, category is Kalimachus. Uh, so six passages in both part of the show words come from Kalimachus and uh, from the Ashwagan text named for the Museo. Uh, same as with the text of the album, which is very soft, but not much in writing Kalimachus as a source. So um, I think we are running out of time, so I'm going a little bit faster. Um, the, ex uh, the excerpts of Kalimachus' works are related to water's power. For example, uh, 131 deals with uh, the power found in the Sea of Demonysus. Uh, the version of Chetaris is longer uh, than this of Chetantigonus. Uh, paragraph 154 talks about the power of uh, the river Cretis, that turns Pivots here below. Uh, here we can see that the Pseudo Stopu, although he mentions uh, the effect of gratis, mentions also the effect of the river Sibaris, who turns, uh, whose water makes people uh, timorous. So, as far as the passage of Pseudo Aristotle is concerned, uh, we have observed that the same terms uh, in Greek, Tirticus and uh, some thought requests are also used by Strabo in uh, Geography 6.1.13. Uh, the third passage in uh, 1502 uh, deals with some strange fact taking place at the lake Argos, literally the lake without birds. So, one thing from choices uh, follows concerning the accuracy or not uh, of this description. Uh, the next two passages deal with uh, the extraordinary powers of the water uh, in Lake Ascania and the wells in the city of Pythopolis. Uh, finally, the last passage in 172 talks about the strange uh, relationship between people and animals on the island of uh, Dionysia. Uh, we find again a difference between the text of Chekhov and Chekhov Aristotle. A Chekhov uses the term Ornithas, which is birds of vast sight, uh, a term which is found again in Strabo, 
um, geography 6, point 3, point 9. Once you got uses the word uh, aerofluge. So, as I have already mentioned, uh, set pairs of inversion are longer and more explicit in many cases uh, due to the fact that the author had more information. Uh, we have also some indication about the more precise date of the Mirabilia. We have mentioned that in two occasions, set pairs are often preferred to use the terms found in Strabo rather than the one used by Chesmontigamus. This observation confirms the fact that the Chesmontigamus and Mirabilia were not written in a single effort, nor in a single time frame. Uh, but it, uh, the text we have nowadays is a compilation of uh, texts uh, whose uh, time frame extends from the year to the era to the 5th century AD. And we can find it the fourth part, it's the passages from the Italian uh, tradition. Uh, these passages uh, constitute uh, a separate category, and I have not uh, mentioned them uh, when we were examining the history of animals in the first part because they did not explicitly mention the original source. Uh, who probably is Aristotle, but still we don't know it and we don't have either an uh, indirect choice uh, proving that. So the first example concerns the voices of frogs, of Seriphos and of Cyrene. Uh, a similar, uh, the same uh, passage is found also in Theophrastus. According to Elia, on the nature of animals, again, uh, book 3, uh, point 37. The next passage deals uh, with the absence of uh, wolves and snakes in Crete, according to the uh, The origin of this passage may, may be uh, a passage of uh, the Demensibus of John Lydia, Book 2, uh, Section 10, where the author states that, um, according to Antigonus, there are no wolves or owls in Crete. It is thus possible that John Lydia uh, does not refer to Pseudonticlus and the collection, but he refers to um, the work uh, on animals written by uh, the real Pseudonticlus of Aristos, the biographer and grammarian. Uh, the next passage, I think it's the last one, yeah. uh, is found. Um, in summary, in the library of uh, photos, and is classified um, by um, by Valentine Rose among the excerpts of Theophrastus. So Theophrastus mentions that uh, mice on the island of Ilaros eat iron along with gold, but Septuagintus, Aristotle, and later Elia um, keep only uh, the iron. And uh, finally. Uh, the behavior of the goats in Kefalonia or in Xante. Uh, <coughs> only the water, we do not drink water during the annual, uh, the annual wind. Uh, it's probably drawn from a passage um, found in uh, Theophrastus, again according to uh, the nature of animals of Aelian, Book 3, Section 32. So, coming to a conclusion. Uh, the conclusions uh, concern on the one hand the relationship between the two Pantachographic authors uh, with their sources, and uh, on the other hand, with some general ideas on uh, what uh, is this type of literature. So, the similarity between uh, the two authors indicate that their sources were uh, probably circulated independently uh, during the Hellenistic Age. And that uh, Sergio Aristotle was familiar at least uh, with the work of Antigonus. We have seen how uh, the contamination of sources uh, basically regarding uh, the circulation of texts under the name of Aristotle went by. Although it's not easy to distinguish them, modern research has uh, proceeded in proving, at least, that uh, a part of Aristotle's naturalistic work 
did uh, circulate, uh, did circulate in banking and it was probably uh, used by many authors. We also observe um, that the circumstances is very concerned with uh, documentations of uh, documentation sources and he tries to cite the sources nearly in every concept while the author of the Mirabilia and later anonymous by the geographers such as uh Gatus Vaticanus do not do so. So this text um, as all the paradoxographical text do not belong um, to a certain uh, gender or type. They are both um, representative examples of paradoxography, uh, uh, but in the meaning that they are based on common uh, practices, on the practice of the of the exegesis and of the collection of uh, data, which uh, guides us to consider paradoxography not as uh, as a literary gender, but rather as a practice or a tendency which grew up um, in the Hellenistic era and escalated very quickly. Uh, the paradoxographers are, are identified as collectors or consumers of ideas, and their objective is to fabricate uh, the markets. This is to manipulate passages that exist in the in the pre-existing literature in such a way that uh, admiration is highly provoked. Um, however, paradoxography is also highly elusive. This means that for a less acquainted or for a less educated uh, public, an expert or a passage uh, describing uh, a marker or a, an oddity of the nature may appear uh, extraordinary, but for educated readers, for educated people, uh, who could uh, immediately go back and think of the original source, this doesn't mean anything. Uh, so, part of the geographers uh, give us access uh, to a lot of information, offering uh, a fertile ground for epitomization and reorganization. The, the dance form of uh, the text and uh, the rich information that provide us, as uh, well as uh, the practices and the techniques uh, developed in order to rewrite uh, their passages, indicate that, uh, that paradoxographical texts are not considered anymore as a secondary or a second-hand literature because we have the original version, the original point of view of the author which discriminates them from the original classic origin source. Uh, although the early paradoxographical works uh, such as those of Kalimachus or Antigonus are considered generally as uh, pseudo-scientific, uh, this tendency, as I have told you, uh, grew very, very, very quickly, and so more and more content uh, was uh, was added in a way that Roman paradoxography has nothing to do with Hellenistic paradoxography. Phlegon of Charles, who is a Roman paradoxographer, uh, described um, sexual activities. Uh, monkeys that are born from humans, uh, monsters, and stuff like that, which has nothing to do with the linguistic part of the um, who focus mainly on some uh, oddities of nature, but who, uh, ha who have a, a base. Uh, a normal, I mean, a normal logic behind. So, summing up, uh, we can clearly state that paradoxography uh, can no longer be dismissed um, as uh, a parasitic growth from the tree of historical and natural <coughs> literature, as Smith and Stalin supported back in 1920. No other derivative literature, according to Stevens and Delcroix in 1996. 
contemporary researchers continue to examine in detail uh, paradox of life of the race, uh, which have not uh, been as much uh, investigated nor appreciated as they deserve. And we hope that new ideas, uh, new commentaries, uh, and new perspectives will pop up in the next years. Uh, concerning matters of graphical authors and texts in order to better understand and finally their nature. So, I hope I didn't confuse you. <laughs> I hope I didn't get bored. I am open for discussion for questions you might have or you might have not. Fascinating paper, and um, so before leaving the broadcast, uh, we would like to thank Birkbeck University as we're in one of the activities today. Um, so, thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>